I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Matt Amato. I work at a company outside Philadelphia called uh, AGI. I've been there for 16 years. And I'm one of the co-founders of the Cesium Project, uh, which many of you hopefully are familiar with. And today I'm here to talk to you about um, my experiences exploring OpenStreetMap data with uh, the new Open 3D Tiles format and Cesium. So while I'm probably one of the world's foremost experts on Cesium, I was a complete and total noob when it came to OSM data. And I you know, had to dig in and try and figure out you know, how to use it to visualize it in 3D. So um, I'm going to go pretty quick here and gloss over some of this uh, early information just because I only have 15 minutes. But for those of you who might not be familiar with Cesium, uh, it's a JavaScript library for 3D globes and maps. You can do 2D and what we call Columbus View as well. Uh, it's an Apache 2.0 license, obviously it says Fos4G, so you very permissive license. Uh, it's written completely in HTML standards, largely WebGL, so it runs anywhere, just like any other web page on your phone, on a tablet. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the awesome community we have. We have a forum with over 900 members, and we don't even require membership in order to post, so that's really exciting. And something I'm really proud and honored to say is that we've seen large adoption across a variety of industries, and there's been several talks uh, at FOS4G involving cesium. So I'm going to jump right into uh, the problem that this demo helped us solve, which is we wanted to leverage open formats in cesium. That was our goal. When we started, we said, we don't want to get into the format game. Everyone's got their own standard. We don't want to mess with that. We're just going to leverage the open geospatial data that's out there and the formats that are out there. And then we quickly ran into some problems that we suspected might be there. but. Most data, a lot of formats, it's, it's 2D only, or very li limited support for 3D. GeoJSON, for example, you can have a height property that says this polygon's in the air, but you can't actually make 3D shapes with it. Uh, same thing, 3D formats are not always web friendly, or they're not really visualization minded. Even something like GML or CityGML, it's a good geospatial format for data interoperability, but it's not really laid out in a way that it can be officially, uh, efficiently visualized, uh, especially in a browser, where your CPU uh, usage is fairly limited. And, and the third part, something we struggle with and will continue to struggle with for a while, is that good open 3D geospatial data sets are kind of hard to find. Um, you can trace maps and add footprints to OSM. You can't trace a three-dimensional building from imagery and get heights and roof details and all the other things you'll see in the demo. So we, we got pulled kicking and screaming into a new goal, which is help create open 3D formats and standards. And then we also wanted to take all the existing standards and make it easy to process this data into visualization-friendly things, mainly because users on our forum were constantly requesting, you know, help me get this data into Cesium. So here's just some of our early efforts. I'm going to gloss over these, but I'm happy to talk afterwards about any of them. Uh, the most specific, uh, important one here, and you can tell by the fancy logo, is GLTF, because that is actually the first open format we helped spearhead that actually became a standard. Uh, Kronos is the same governing body that does OpenGL, WebGL, and a uh, plethora of all the graphics formats that kind of drive half the graphics in the world, I'd say. And uh, so that was a you know, really proud moment for us. We still had a problem. Uh, even with this, these formats we started, there was kind of this lacking format for massive heterogeneous data. So buildings, point clouds, trees, mail, you know, all the mailboxes and fire hydrants in Manhattan, large-scale 3D vector data. So uh, you know, vector tiles, for example, uh, the snazzy thing we like to say is uh, 3D is a lot more than 2D plus 1. You just can't take something made for 2D and add a couple extra attributes. Uh, everything about 3D is different. And so that's where uh, last August we introduced 3D tiles. So 3D tiles is a new open format to kind of do uh, that missing link, heterogeneous, large-scale geospatial data. Some of you may have come to some of the other talks about 3D tiles in general. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because specifically I just want to show you the cool stuff I've learned. And that brought me to New York City. So about the same time that we were doing 3D tiles and they just started to get to the point where we could actually run data with them, um, I really wanted to find some good open data to, to kind of leverage a muscle. And at the same time, thanks to Twitter, I found out New York had just did this massive data import on OSM and supposedly had height data and all, all these other cool things. And I was super unfamiliar with OSM data, so I'm going to jump right into the demo here. Uh, this demo is live, so I live on the edge, uh, especially with this Wi-Fi. But uh, if you want to go to this uh, URL on your laptop, you will be able to run the demo as well. So let me go over here. I'm actually going to start by hitting F5 so you don't think I'm cheating. Um, this is actually, uh, again, this is running. Let me go to the home button. 
And this is just loading data uh, from S3, actually, in this case, uh, on the fly. And you'll see one of the biggest things and our biggest you know, importance for 3D tiles is we didn't want to just make a pretty picture. So everything here is all about interactivity. So I can click on the World Trade Center, for example, and you see some metadata there. Um, you know, I can come over here, I can zoom around, I'll just do a quick uh, tour of the five boroughs. You know, we got Manhattan, uh, Brooklyn. So this data is just streaming in as needed. Overall, this is over 1.1 million buildings from Open uh, OpenStreetMap. And not only that, but as you see, as I'll get to World Trade Center and things like the World Financial Center, these are not 3D extrusions. A lot of 3D OSM data that you see is simply the footprint and a height. But here, for example, you have like honest to God domes at two World Financial Center. And this doesn't highlight, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. I, I hit my head against the wall for a couple hours on this one. Um, same thing with the roofs from the World Trade Center where you know the, it's not just an extrusion, it's actually a slant with a cone. Uh, on top of that and that interactivity, as you saw, you can get to the metadata. So everything here, you can see all the data from OSM. You can actually click on a link and get to the OSM uh, item. So if you did see something wrong or something interesting or wanted to find out more, you could do that. And uh, on top of that, you can do things like color by height or other data dribble, data, data, excuse me, data driven styling. So uh, for example, here, none of this data is pre-canned. I'm just using Chroma JS under the hood. Uh, to generate uh, height scales, so basically the taller the building is, it's different colors. And this could be anything. So for example, we have users that have correlated energy data, and so they're coloring buildings based, based, uh, based on energy use. And even more so, they're doing that based on time of year or other kind of time dynamic formats. So we have lots of way anything can be driven. Here I actually have a slider, go back to normal OSM colors, and I can say, oh, only show buildings that are at a certain height. So if you're like walk, uh, trying to look at some small building in New York, you can actually hide the taller buildings if they're in your way. Um, so all of this is completely data driven and uh, it's very dynamic and interactive. So I'm gonna go back and talk a little bit, let me see, there we go, uh, about the pipeline for, for how I bit the demo. And we're gonna go back to the demo uh, briefly as well. So uh, the first thing I needed was data. So like I said, I was kind of sort of familiar with OSM uh, and then I found out, well, yeah, you download the OSM data, which is a 70 gig uh, PDF file, so Google protocol buffer. And I, I figured, you know, I, I programmed once or twice. Starting with the 70 gig file probably wasn't the best thing to do. So I stumbled on um, some sites that have OSM extracts, which are just cutouts of OSM data used for, you know, specific regions. Uh, the one I've been using lately is shout out to MapZen. They do metro extracts. And that's kind of where I grabbed the PBF uh, file for New York from. It's only about 75 megabytes worth of data. But as you'll see, that, that's misleading when it comes to 3D visualization. So uh, at the same time, because I apparently can't learn just one new thing at a time, I was diving into Node.js development. And so I'm like, oh, OK, yeah, Node.js is going to be the future. So um, let, me, let me work with Node.js. And it turned out, sure enough, NPM came through. And there was a module called the OSM PBF reader, or parser, excuse me, OSM PBF parser. And I'm like, oh, great. So I, I went to the Wikipedia pages, and I was learning about the different you know, metadata and other things associated with OSM data. But now I just dumped it out of JSON, because that's, face it, whenever you're dealing with a format, that's ultimately what you do. Console log, printf, it's the programmer's best friend. So now I have a JSON representation. Remember how I said that data formats weren't really built for visualization, and OSM data is no exception. So for example, this is the World Trade Center in JSON. And it's not the entire World Trade Center, but this is the fundamental, what the OSM calls a relation, the key that defines the OSM, uh, the One World Trade Center, and then it references other parts of the building. So you have to kind of follow these parks and go, and then you can bind them all. And after about a day of work, I ended up producing a collada file of the World Trade Center. Uh, for eagle-eyed viewers, there's actually a little bit of the roof missing over here, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so this was all done. Uh, we did a code sprint at the Jersey Shore. Why a bunch of programmers went to the Jersey Shore, I'm not sure, because we were locked inside, away from sunlight, pretty much all day. Um, so uh, you know, we, this was like a week-long project. So this is like day one. So then I'm like, okay, I did one building. I know what a for loop is. So maybe I can do all the buildings. And uh, my first run took an infinite amount of time because I wasn't passing the right flag to Node.js for memory reasons. And so I told Node.js, actually use the memory on my system, not the one gig or three gig limit you have built in by default. So after I uh, did a little happy dance around everything, and I ended up with 1.1, actually 1,160,832, I think, uh, collada files. So that's a lot of data. So the problem with that many files is simply getting it to the client. So for example, you can't make 
you know, and some of those views we saw, we weren't looking at all New York, but even if you limit to the views, you're looking at a thousand buildings. So you need to efficiently batch those requests. So using 3D tiles, what we did, here's a neighborhood in New York, a bunch of row homes, or brownstones, whatever they call them, the Philly guys, so. Uh, anyway, so this is all batched into a single tile, so now you make a single request. Okay, so now we were viewing the data. So once I started viewing the data and it, I brought it all in, uh, oh, by the way, this is all batched up. Once batched up, this went from 1.1 million Colada files to 3,500 tiles. And it went from 7.62 gigabytes of data down to 300 megs. So now we have the ability to actually serve this up and stream it. And it's actually so small you could download this to a USB stick and run it offline, but that kind of defeats the purpose. So uh, now, now we're streaming the data. And then I ran into that problem I was showing you earlier. I come over here to Q Financial Center, and why isn't this highlighting? And I'm like, okay, what, what's going on? I beat my head against the wall. And after a couple hours, I'm like, okay, let me just go look at the relation. Come over here, and I go, okay, well, here's all the relations. And then what is this part? Oh, here's a number, and let me come search over here. Now, there's a lot here. I'm not going to do it. But I promise you, this part is not in this building relation. And it turns out that there are uh, hundreds of these in OSM where there's a, buy, a building labeled, I'm a part of a building, and then no parent building that actually says, oh, this is my part. And so using that dynamic styling I talked about, here are all the broken uh, OSM relations in New York, right? So without even trying to do analysis, just the, the demo of I'm going to show the 3D data in 3D revealed problems with the data that had gone completely unnoticed. Now, I need to be a good citizen and actually generate some change sets out of this and commit them back to OSM. I'll admit I haven't done that yet. Uh, maybe partially I would love to have an interactive GUI to be able to do that through, the, uh, through, through this app even maybe. So that's just some of the data that some ways of just looking at data in 3D can really reveal some of this. And if you see whole buildings like I think this is four financial center, four world uh, financial center, uh, every single part of this building is an orphaned relation. Anyway. And then one last thing, because I'm almost out of time, is shadow. So this is a brand new feature we're coming. You can't actually get to it from the demo. I'm gonna, you're going to be in the know. I'm going to add the super secret shadows query parameter to the app. And forgive me here, because now, again, I'm an adrenaline junkie. Not only is it a live demo, it's a live demo of a prototype branch. So um, I'm actually going to switch to the actual OSM visualization of the imagery. And so now you'll see, let's see, go over here to a nice spot. Hopefully this is coming through. You see the shadows. And I was like, hmm, I know shadows are important. I'm not a uh, geospatial guy. I'm a computer science now. So I look up like shadow study, and it turns out that's a thing. So I'm like, oh, I bet we could use cesium to do shadow studies. So I made it 4 o'clock. And then I told cesium, hey, every frame, draw 4 o'clock the next day. So now this started at May 1st, 2016, and it's going to go for a year, and it's going to show 4 o'clock every day. And as you can see, shadow, sun gets lower getting dark earlier, you know, and you see the shadows walk back and forth. And I'm pretty sure um, there's actually, in some places, there's laws about how much a park can be in shadow over the day or how, how a building has shadow. In New York, they actually, to go the opposite end, a uh, building was melting cars for a little while because it was so reflective that the sun was hitting uh, the sides of cars. So this is just another, you know, interesting thing that kind of you can do on the fly in 3D visualization is all coming on the client. So as we develop this, you'll be able to do things like, how long is this point in shadow? You know, and right now I'm doing a day of frame, but you can do it in real time. You can do, oh, show me over a 24-hour period. Uh, the next step would be add other light sources and then cast shadows from them. So I'm running short on time. But uh, in conclusion, if there's one takeaway I want everyone to have, and maybe I'm preaching to the choir, open data directly drives open development. If it weren't for this massive OSM uh, extract that I could try and import into cesium, um, we wouldn't have found half, you know, not, not just those OSM issues that I mentioned, but bugs in cesium. There were lots of issues in cesium that we found simply from having the data available to play with. And um, not just uh, bugs, but features in general. Um, I didn't get to demo them, but some of the mouse controls are context sensitive because when you're down in the weeds in, in Times Square, you know, you want to be able to go up and kind of crawl up a building or go forward and backward in the street. So open data directly drives open development. Uh, other thing is, the OSM data for New York is probably the best data there is. OSM still needs a lot of work elsewhere. I wanted to show uh, Raleigh, and I zoomed to it, and it's like 200,000 completely flat buildings. So there's still a lot of ways to go, but I think the open data movement is still improving. And in fact, there's a San Francisco height import going on right now. 
uh, which uh, at that point we'll be able to have buildings on terrain in San Francisco. It should be pretty awesome. Uh, and just one plug because I want to have more time to work on cool demos instead of my day job. So we are hiring. Uh, so uh, if you're curious, come by the booth or see me. Uh, whether you're a 3D developer, we're looking for a geospatial data lead. I have a feeling most of you qualify for that. And then, uh, you know, whether you like my talk or hated my talk, hopefully like my talk, go to Phosphor DNA and uh, rate all the talks. And I know that they definitely use this data in order to help uh, facilitate next year's program. All right, and I think I actually made 15 minutes, so if anyone has any questions. Yeah, so one of the, so I should have mentioned this, um, uh, a lot of what we did here is directly benefited, not just from LSM data. So now we're working on a city GML importer or even just extrusion. So if you just had a footprint with a height, you can totally do that in cesium today with using the same techniques we did. And actually it'd be a little easier. <laughs> yes? Uh, yes, so that's part of the 3D tiles um, kind of concept is that you can have different geospatial um, trees depending on how your data is laid out. So in this particular uh, data set, we have what we call a loose quad tree to where we didn't want to split any buildings in half. So we make a normal quad tree, but then we extend each of the tiles so they overlap so that no tile splits any other building. But this same technique is used for point clouds and vector data. So for point cloud, we have an oak tree, for example. Um, we just did a talk earlier this afternoon on 3D tiles. Those slides will be up, um, or you can stop by the booth. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.